feel a little bit like the rest of the center, so she is glad I'll step in. Um, our Fez was supposed to give this presentation <clears throat> for you today, and he was uh, not able to come, so I will do my best. Uh, and I forgot to put in my slides that this whole work was funded by the State Soil Conservation Commission. Um, they provided two, two grants to Johnson County with Art and myself as, as co-PIs, um, looking at paver systems, and then we're also looking at bioretention cells. The bioretention work is just getting going, so I'm going to focus more on the paver part of the research that we've been doing and, and try and get into that with you today. So the goal of our project was really to understand how per permeable, uh, pervious pavers impacting surround soils and water bodies. So we had a couple of different objectives. We wanted to look at whether uh, if we were infiltrating water into those paper systems, were we making foundations along buildings, um, moist or having problems there? Um, what do we see in terms of the amount of water coming out of the systems? And then also looking at some water quality parameters. Um, you guys are, I'm sure, pretty familiar with these systems, but essentially we've got a rock chamber and pavers on top. From a monitoring perspective, what we tried to do is monitor the outflow pipe that you see at the bottom there of the, the diagram. So we're trying to look at any water that's coming out of those pipes. Um, but we also decided to put a couple wells inside those rock chambers because we wanted to be able to pull water out of the rock chamber to look for water chemistry things um, and also be able to measure the, the amount of water the, the height of the water in those rock chambers. So um, when you take a look at uh, some of the graphs later, you'll see that that's what we're trying to do. Initially, with this grant, we wanted to look at sites just in eastern Iowa because we were essentially working out of the University of Iowa and we were working out of Iowa City. Um, Based on the State Soil Conservation Commission recommendations, they really want us to be in different soils. They wanted us to not just focus on eastern Iowa, but to be out in western Iowa as well, and, and lust-based soils and, and tills. Uh, so we ended up adding, in addition to Iowa City and Coralville, we did some projects in Davenport, Dubuque, West Union, Ankeny, and Storm Lake. And I'll talk about a variety of these different projects over the next, next couple of minutes. But it gives you a sense of the challenge. Um, this was a big effort to try and get intensive water monitoring on such a huge geographical area in the state of Iowa. So our key research questions were, you know, what effect does the, the uh, paver system have on urban stormwater? What's the rate at which water is percolating from the rock chamber into the soil? How effective is that pervious system at reducing runoff? And then what do we have in terms of the way of delivery of urban pollutants to the, uh, the, the streams around um, in the urban areas? So just an example, again, we talked about, I talked about the, the ch rock chambers. So you see here, I don't know which one's the pointer. I should know by now after eight presentations. Oh, so here you see um, we've got wells that we're dropping down into the rock chamber so that we can put a, a pressure transducer in there to look at water levels. Also it provides a port for us to pull water out for water chemistry analysis. So um, here we are, you know, putting a set of these wells into the chamber. Here's a pressure transducer Art is holding. Essentially this thing is just hanging down in that well, measuring the, um, the height of the water in the well, and that shows me just kind of dropping it down into a well in, in Dubuque. So a couple of examples of the projects that we did. Um, the first one was a patio in Iowa City. So you kind of see the before and after. Um, we had just a, a regular patio and then with the paver system more along, along the entire back of the house. This is one case where we really wanted to see whether infiltrating water into that, those chambers was going to impact the foundation of this house. So where are we going to get excessive water building up along that foundation? So that was one of the questions we had there. In terms of, and this is again teeny, in the teeny graph vein of today, um, we have a couple things going on. Here are precipitation events. So we have from uh, May 1st of 2015 out to <laughs> um, October 30th. So here's all the precipitation events that we had during that time frame. Some pretty significant events happening during that time frame. And then what the tan bar show you is the water level in those cells. So what we're seeing is that a very rapid response and then a drop in those cells. And that's pretty typical of what we saw with all of our paver systems, where that they were exceedingly responsive. Water would move into the cell and then move away pretty quickly. And I'll talk about some of the challenges that presented for us later. If we look at the soil moisture levels, again, what we saw is 
during those rainfall events, a big increase in the soil moisture right at that, that foundation level, but it dropped very rapidly. So we did not see any evidence in, in this system. We were also in West Union and a couple other places. In none of our projects did we see any evidence that water was ponding or hanging out next to those foundations any more than it would happen in just a regular rainstorm. So there's no evidence that we were really moving water towards those foundations and causing problems. So that's a really good news story out of this entire research project is that those systems are not going to, in, in the research that we've done, create problems for foundations. And, and again, I've got, we've got scads of data. There will be a report that comes out on this whole, part, whole project that shows all the, the soil moisture data that we've collected. Uh, the next project was a Coraval driveway. Uh, Mayor John Lindell, who's a real pioneer in terms of adapting into these practices, he has kind of a circular driveway, and he went ahead and put in a, a paver system in his driveway. Um, you can see it's a fairly large paver system. And he was um, so visionary, he actually dropped his own well into the system before we even showed up. So this project was in place and perfect for us just to come in there and take advantage of. Um, if you take a look at the Coralville event response, again, in this case, we sort of reversed it on you, but the, um, the tan color is precipitation events. So this goes from uh, September 9th at 1500, 2014, all the way out to um, September 10th. So this is basically two days of data. And you can see we had a number of peaks in the rainfall information. And then the blue is the water level in the cell. So now we've got, again, a rainfall event. The water's moving into the cell very quickly, but it drops out very rapidly. And particularly with this paver system that we had at John's property, we never got a single drop from his outflow pipe. And we had some very big rainfall events with John's property. We never got water out of his system. Um, and we'll talk about sort of the implications both for monitoring, but also the sizing and, and engineering of, of these systems in a little bit. So if we take a look at kind of breaking down the numbers, for those of you who are engineers and like numbers, um, for example, here's the Coralville driveway. We could look at the total precipitation, um, 29 inches over the course of from May to um, uh, November, about 29 inches of rain. Um, you can see that the total inflow to the system was uh, 5,700 coming out uh, cubic feet. And again, what to really notice in this system is that we never got any outflow of that system. So that's, I think, a big win for this project is that we never had any water coming out. And we've calculated some of the infiltration rates uh, for various storms on John's property. And again, some pretty high infiltration rates um, on soils that are not really great soils. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about Dubuque, where they were sitting on essentially sandy soils. Um, these are less dry so soils. They aren't terribly good normally at infiltrating, but we saw pretty amazing levels of infiltration in this system. Uh, we also looked at West Union, Iowa. In West Union, again, it was similar to John's uh, project where this was uh, built already. So we didn't come in and be able to design the paver system and try and capture things. Um, it was a little bit more challenging because this West Union project was in place. Not all the water was terribly confined in a, in a system. There was rainfall and runoff coming into the system from places that were outside the pavers that were coming into the pavers. From a monitoring perspective, you want to design it a little bit more tightly so that you know exactly what's coming into the system. It's all hitting the pavers, and you can monitor that very carefully. We didn't exactly have that in West Union. Um, it's a great project, don't get me wrong, but from a monitoring perspective, provided some challenges for us. In all of the street systems that we were monitoring, we tried to do some flow monitoring, um, and West Union was really challenging. So in the end, we uh, grabbed, or Art grabbed his friends at the, the flood center and IIHR to help us do some modeling um, using some of the sensor data that was in there. And it, again, if the take home message here is that we've got a September rainfall event, so here's the rainfall information. You can see that peak information. And the sensors that were in the system shows, you know, essentially how much uh, the, the volume of water that's coming off that system and what was modeled to come off the system. And, and the model kind of shows that without pavers, um, we would have a very big spike versus what we really saw, which was a, a slow infiltration, water coming out of that system much more gradually than without a paver system, a, a huge spike. So again, the modeling information showing that um, you know, we would have had a, a pretty negative impact on West Union without those paver systems. 
The other part of the program, the other component of the research was we were trying to look at the, the water quality in the system. So what, what kind of uh, heavy metal information were we seeing, um, nutrients and those sorts of things. This was the most challenging part of the project. Unlike the water level information where you could put a pressure transducer in a well and walk away and come back and, uh, and download that data, people needed to be mobilized to pull samples. These are very challenging to try and put an ISCO sampler on there, an automatic sampler, because the water is simply moving through the system so quickly, it is difficult to pull the volume of water through an ISCO sampler. So you really need to mobilize a person. And as we all know, it rains at night, it rains on weekends, it rains when you're busy doing something else. And so this was a very huge collaborative project where we really had to pull people that were locally um, accessible to come out and get samples. And as a result, uh, the water monitoring piece got going a little bit slower than the, the water level information. And we have a number of partners uh, who helped collect water quality data around the state and, and really appreciate all the efforts that they had. Um, essentially, the setup was we have a, a flask and a hand pump which creates a vacuum in the flask and it pulls water out of the system. Uh, the contaminants that we normally would see in stormwater, we would predict to see in stormwater, of course, would be things like sediment from construction site, uh, information or construction site uh, work, pesticides and nutrients from lawns or surrounding areas, bacteria, obviously you would expect to see in stormwater, oil and grease from cars and that kind of thing, um, heavy metals from the industrial areas or for, from breaks, as well as sand and salt, chloride, that kind of thing, um, and trash and thermal pollution. Uh, we did do some thermal monitoring. I'm not showing that data today. Uh, I'm going to focus mostly, mostly on the contaminant information that we collected. So from a water monitoring standpoint, again, this shows a sample collector. You can notice that the number of bottles we had because of the number of contaminants was a huge number of bottles. And again, this is why it was challenging to try and think about doing an ISCO sampling protocol because we had to fill all these bottles. And the reality was that we had a difficult time even in a rainstorm, we're standing there trying to pull samples out of the cells during a rainstorm. We did not always get enough water to fill all these bottles. So we had to prioritize which bottles we were going to fill first. And not every site got every parameter because of that issue. Um, so things that we were doing were, you know, the original goal is we wanted to sample what was coming into the system, what was in the system, and then what's going out of the system, which sounds super easy, super elegant, you know. Super easy button, and as Jesse knows, nothing is ever super easy in monitoring. The problem that we had was trying to get that inflow data. So if you look at, if you think about John Lundell's property, there was no inflow. It was what was directly precipitating onto his property. So it was difficult to capture the water quality in that rainfall right falling on his, on his uh, driveway or on a patio system. In the case of, say, West Union or some of these other areas, again, it was challenging to try and funnel water in as a retrofit. So um, one of our take home messages is if we continue this and with the bioretention project, we have a lot more control on the inflow data. So we don't have really any inflow data, which is definitely a challenge for us in this project. Instead, what we had is collecting samples from the rock chamber and the outflow where we had outflows occurring. Um, we had a protocol that said, we want you to sample after an inch and quarter of rainfall, go out there and sample. And uh, you know, we didn't really know how responsive these systems were gonna be. Um, it really turned into, you need to sample immediately after and potentially during the rainfall event. Because again, as I showed you with John Lundell's property, his system completely drained within a, a matter of at an hour at the max, and sometimes it was a matter of minutes. So if we weren't out there in the rainstorm, we simply couldn't capture what was in that rock chamber, and nothing ever came out of the pipe there. Um, we had some difficulty lining people up to sample, so that was a, a challenge for us. And because of the volume of water issue, we have a limited number of samples. I'm just like caveating the crap out of this um, project, so. But we'll see why. Um, we were not able to collect any samples, therefore, from 
um, the Iowa City patio or Ankeny Wells in terms of, we just simply couldn't get enough volume of water. Ankeny had an outflow that did actually run, but in the cells we were not able to get any water, and the patio, we just simply couldn't get any water out of that, that system, which is a, a good thing. The water's all moving into the system. Um, and again, no discharge from the Dubuque alleys, which were sitting on essentially sand um, or the Coralville driveway. And we don't have first flush devices that were installed, but that would be a, a thing we would do in the future for sure. If we think about kind of typical concentrations um, in urban environments, this is from the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. <clears throat> uh, 11 city sites that are out there give you a sense of what generally we saw in, in uh, urban water quality. Now these sites are relatively larger city, um, or relatively larger streams than a little urban stream. So take this again with a little asterisk, but you know, typical nitrate concentrations might be six and a half, chloride about 28 milligrams per liter, E. coli is all over the place, but the, the median concentration in our city sites is about 199, um, orthophosphorate about 0.18 milligrams per liter, total phosphorus about double that, and so total suspended solids about 18. So that gives you a little bit of context of what we expected to see or potentially would predict to see in some of these urban samples that we were collecting. So if we take a look at the contaminant detection frequency, first of all, um, the take home message here is that motor oil and total extractable hydrocarbons were frequently, frequently detected, but most of the other hydrocarbons were not. Gasoline, kerosene, mineral spirits, we never saw those. Um, chloride, obviously the main component of road salt, we saw all of the time, and nutrients and bacteria were, were found all the time. Again, not terribly surprising um, that we would detect these all the time, but we wanted to take a look at, at that. If we break that down into this big ugly table, uh, the summary, so what I've done in this, this table is that you have for each uh, sort of set of like-minded uh, sites, so here we have outlets and then the wells. So we can compare the outlet chloride levels in terms of median, maximum, me uh, sorry, minimum, maximum, median, and average for the outlets and for the wells. So these are all paired up, outlet well, outlet well, outlet well. So you can kind of see how these match up. Um, we had 25 outlet samples, mostly driven by Dover Court and um, mostly driven by Dover Court, as well as um, about 19 samples from, from wells. Take home message from this is that chloride was significantly higher in the outlets versus the wells. And we're not entirely sure why that is, but we saw higher levels of chloride coming out of those outlets. It may be driven by the fact that that outlet data is, is coming from the Dover, Creek, or Dover Court project, which is a, uh, a street project and I think did get some salt even though I think they tried not to salt it as much and there's maybe some Davenport people here who can verify or refute that. Um, if we take a look at nitrate, nitrate concentrations were frequent as you saw before but concentrations were quite low and so if you take a look at the nitrate data uh, you know, we're seeing averages about one and one and a half, so very, very low nitrate levels, essentially background concentrations um, in groundwater where you don't have a lot of agricultural influence, very low levels of, of nitrate. Um, we saw that the motor oil and total extractable hydrocarbons were about one and a half times higher in the wells versus the outlets. So here we have kind of the reverse situation of chloride, more hydrocarbons in those wells. Again, if you think about sort of the setting of the wells, um, that data tends to be more driven by uh, the, the driveways. So we may be seeing hydrocarbons kind of uh, being washed off into those driveways sitting in those wells. So a little bit higher in the wells versus the outlets. The total suspended solids, also were significantly higher in the wells versus the outlets. And here I think what we're seeing is we've got crushed rock in that, those cells. We're probably getting some washing of those rocks and that's the total suspended solids. So it's not, they're not discharging those solids, but there is total suspended solids in those chambers because of the fact that we've got crushed rock in there. Uh, we saw about similar levels of ortho P and total P in, in outlets and wells. There wasn't a significant difference between the outlets and wells. And bacteria levels were elevated in both systems, but the bacteria data are extremely variable. And so we're, we're not really able to say we're seeing higher levels in the outlets versus the wells. Um, we did see some potential evidence that, for example, um, 
animals like to hang out in pipes. So we may have some uh, habitat where we've got animals creating a bacteria problem in those pipes. Uh, if we drill down into one of the projects, so this is again, I've mentioned Dover Court and Davenport a couple times. The way that this works is we've got essentially a street that's got this kind of U-shaped phenomena. Um, the paver system goes partway up the streets. So we've got just regular concrete moving into the paver system. We had a well here and a well here. This well system is moving to a bioretention cell. Over here, water's flowing down, coming down here as well. Well three, well four, moving into this bioretention system. And then all of this is moving to an outlet system. So where possible, we tried to sample these wells, the outlets, and then this overall outlet. Um, and this was a project that had a lot of water moving, unlike some of the other projects where we weren't able to get much water. There was significant water moving through this system. However, we weren't always able to get water out of all of the wells at the same time. So I'm going to focus on just this side of the, the street project. So if we take a look at one particular event um, of July of 2016, what we see is in terms of E. coli, well one and well two had pretty high levels of E. coli compared to the outlet, right? So that was kind of an interesting phenomenon. If we take a look then, again, this is a, a typical situation where well one and two had higher levels of total suspended solids and essentially no total suspended solids at the outlet, which is again a really positive thing. Here again, I think we've just got that washed rock. You know, we're pulling a little bit of debris off those rocks when we're sampling those wells. Um, and this is a pretty typical situation in Dover Creek as well as other places in the state. This is all over the place. I could show you examples where the reverse is true. The E. coli picture is not a, a consistent picture at all. Um, this is an interesting situation where wells one and two have lowered nitrate levels, so we're less than one here for the wells. The outlet to, uh, to the biocells a little bit higher. And again, uh, what we may getting, be getting here is a little bit of nitrate coming out of that biocell. Um, and we'll be doing more research and more sampling there. And then lastly, again, phosphorus, higher levels of total phosphorus in the wells compared to the outlet. This, these two probably are related in, in some respect in terms of what we're seeing there. Although a lot of this is preliminary and we're working up the data pretty hard right now, so stay tuned on all of that. Uh, a couple of things that you might be interested in, um, the Johnson County Soil and Water Conservation District, which was the financial home and the, the heart of this project, created a, an ArcGIS story map. So the website is down here if you're interested in getting on that story map. It's got pictures of all the sites. Um, the, re the report will go here. There'll be more information coming out here as well. Um, additional outreach that we'll be doing, we, we, we will be writing that final report as well as we have commitments to write an article for the Iowa Academy of Science and there will be technical bulletins and brochures coming out of that. Um, I think there's some evidence out of this research to suggest that we may be over-designed. Is Wayne in here? He's probably going to kill me for saying this. Um, yeah. <laughs> Mary says we maybe have, from a non-engineering standpoint, is that enough caveats? OK, so there's evidence to suggest that these systems, the, the patios, the driveways, are infiltrating every drop of water. I might suggest that we don't need to design it quite to the same level. The stormwater people may totally disagree. Um, the water quality person says we've infiltrated all of that. So there may, be some, there may be some tweaks that we can make to the system. I'll wait for all engineering questions to Wayne to <laughs> decide if he wants to change my my thought process. Um, we're trying to develop a protocol for the development of more water monitoring with this. Um, so we're hoping to have more data. Obviously, we were constricted by the amount of sites that we had, the kinds of soils that we were in, um, a very limited number of years. So one of the questions we still have is, how are these things going to age through time? Um, John's property had been in place for a while, where some of the other ones were relatively new. Um, this patio has this house has been sold, so I think that project is ending, but um, we hope to continue some of the other research projects that are out there in the state. Um, again, the lessons learned, the big take home message is that these systems are reducing the total and peak volumes of water. So 
And I think that's not too surprising, but I think we were, we were surprised by how responsive some of these systems were. And they eliminated runoff in that tile outflow in many, many systems. So that's a, that's a really strong, positive thing. Um, and of course, you know, if we're looking at we've reduced all the runoff, we basically have reduced the, the outlet of contaminants. So one of the things to think about is zero runoff zero pollution coming out of those systems. Um, and that's, again, a, a very positive thing for us. Uh, when we found those pollutants, they tended to be lower than what we saw in kind of typical urban streams. So again, not very, not super hot or high levels of, of things. Um, again, certainly nothing that was making my eyeballs bulge from looking at how high those concentrations were. They were, they were fairly reasonable levels. The E. coli levels are, pretty pretty low compared to some of the things we've seen in the state as an example. Um, we do think that monitoring should be incorporated in more of these projects and we'd like to see more of that designed into the project as opposed to as afterthought because that made it really challenging for us. And we think that we really need to continue, like I said, doing more long-term research on some of these sites, do it more intensively um, with monitoring, water, especially the water quality monitoring that we can really get a, a good perspective. I think sensors have a place to play in this, although the problem is sensors don't like to go dry. And these systems are dry most of the time and then they get water really quickly and then they go dry again. So there's, there's some challenges there in terms of uh, the water quality research. But I'm happy to talk about that at any point. Um, here's a list of all the participants, and, and this is definitely a project that had partnership. Um, there were so many players in this project, it became a little challenging to make sure we were all on the same page at the same time with water quality testing and, and sampling, but it was, I think, a really great project. Um, stay, like I said, stay tuned for the bioretention work that's being done. Um, the work on uh, Highway 965, for example, in Coralville is yielding great results, and I just didn't get into that today because it's mixing the paver and the bioretention, but we're seeing really phenomenal results coming out of that so stay tuned for that next year we'll make art show up and do that presentation um, with that I'm happy to take questions and and entertain comments or thoughts from you guys yeah so I, I saw that you had on there that you were effectively diverting a lot of these contaminants from surface water through infiltration however is there any concern that we're now concentrating these contaminants in yeah, that is, that is a bit of a concern. And one of the things that we um, thought about sort of late in the game is whether we should drop a couple of wells into the subsurface and be pulling samples. So um, we had intentions of doing that at West Union, for example, and we were not able to get those wells in. Um, so there is, there is some concern. Now, some of those parameters, um, you know, I think they would get hung up on some of those, those sediments, but that is, a, that is a piece that we need to be thinking about. Um, and I know back when I was in DNR, one of the questions we were thinking about is, you know, how do we protect groundwater while trying to protect, you know, the surface water, storm water? And those are things, those are still questions, I think, that are, that are hanging out there. Good question. Yeah. Wayne, you want to talk about the engineering side of things? Yeah, there's lots of systems we'll have. Come, come down, come down to the, come down to the microphone. <laughs> I'm the water person, not the engineering person, so I'm going to toss that over to Wayne. I'm not an engineer either, but I work with them a lot. And, uh, <laughs> A lot of the systems will have a geotech style, maybe a, a tensor, like a geo grid. So you got that bearing strength, but the the base is a, not just designed for volume of water; it's designed for bearing strength as well. And that's why these appear to be over designed because it takes a very shallow rock layer to handle that water quality volume or that 1.25 inch rain. So on a patio system, for sure, we could probably shallow that up. But where there's vehicular traffic, we're probably going to have. 10 times the amount of capacity we need for that water quality volume just to have that bearing strength. But I think uh, from what I've seen so far, um, they, they don't seem to be, if they're installed, designed and installed correctly, I, I'm not seeing settle and heave and all of that stuff. Because John's property has been in that system for... Amy, are you in here? Four or five years? 
Yeah. Is that about right? Yeah. And it looks it looks beautiful still. Other questions? Yeah. Do you have a rule of thumb for how much run on is allowed for these systems to say the parking lot, for example? See, we're back to engineering. Come on, come on, Wayne. Let's get a real life engineer. Aaron, are you in the room? <laughs> what was the question? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, you have to calculate that. Um, if you have run on, then you've got to design that base to have the capacity. And we're, we're looking at the, the cubic foot of pore space volume in that rock base. You know what the ratio is, roughly? No, but uh, once you get your cubic foot of run on calculated, then you've got to look at the length and the width and the depth. And we're probably looking at, we're, we haven't decided yet. Uh, somewhere between 32 to 40 percent pore space in a rock chamber so it's, it's pretty easy to determine your cubic foot of water coming on and then your available storage other questions yeah robin um, i wonder what you would say to uh, city councils who very often are more concerned about initial outlays uh, when it comes to installing permeable uh, pavers, which are more expensive to install, but will last longer than either asphalt or concrete. Uh, but what do you say to them when they say, oh, it costs too much? What I say is that, again, I'll, Wayne will jump in here, but I think you have to look at long-term costs and, you know, the ability to fix these things pretty rapidly. So stories, anecdotal stories. So in, in Dubuque, anybody from Dubuque here? Is Dean here? Eric. Eric, Eric's here. So if something breaks in Dubuque, you just pop a few of the pavers up, fix it, and drop it back down, right? So, so the long-term cost is, I think, better than putting down concrete. Um, I'll pick on my employer. So University of Iowa, there's a TN Cleary walkway. They paved it, and then they dropped, you know, pavers into the concrete, which seems very bizarre to me. Um, and when I contacted the sustainability coordinator about that, the comment was, well, facilities thinks it's too expensive to do it your way, to do it with the infiltration way. Um, three years, four years later, they're having to jackhammer the whole thing up and replace it because of um, there's been so much salt application and it's all crumbling. So. You know, that's one anecdotal story, but I think there's evidence now emerging that it long term is less costly. And there isn't, you have to think about, I think, the environmental cost too. So, not having that go into your streams, flooding people downstream because we've got these peak flows we can't manage. I mean, I think to me, we have to think about big societal costs as well as the implementation. But that's me being kind of tree hugger kind of person. I realize there's actual dollars people have to outlay, and we don't always look at, what our stormwater folks are dealing with in terms of you know bigger pipes for more flows um, versus when you just re replace in that street there's a cost there um, is anybody from davenport here you've been doing a lot so you guys you guys are doing this do you think it's more expensive or less expensive or about even okay And I think it gets less expensive the more you do it. Again, if I go back to Dubuque, um, they've got a system where they can throw these alleys in in no time. So the more you develop that experience and a method for making it happen, it, you know, the economies of scale hopefully kick in as well. Um, so I think it is less expensive can or I, about expensive. Can I, can I just have Amy Foster, you might want to comment on this too. And this is bioretention and bioswales on a street project, but they did an economic analysis that showed that the green infrastructure alternatives were actually cheaper because you reduced the number of intakes to storm sewers and downsized pipe. Maybe you want to add to that? That specification is next up in room uh, two. <laughs> okay. And Great then one other thing, uh, Robin. Um, my hometown, they're getting ready to do a new streetscape in the Ped Mall. And I predict we'll have a lot of decorative pavers laid on that concrete base. And we now have contractors that are saying, I will put the permeable in for no more expense than the decorative pavers. 
So why not have a working landscape that's just as aesthetically pleasing? That's great. Thank you.